The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name is Andrew Roxon. Welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. I'm uh, really excited to be interviewing uh, Tim Benson from Infinity, who has flown all the way down to Sydney to see me. He might be uh, the the lure of a potential beverage afterwards. <laughs> um, so, Tim, welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, good to be here. And look, um, we've had a bit of a chat um, beforehand, and um, you're one of the more aspirational uh, planners that, that I've come across in the last couple of years, and that's going to play out over this, uh, this, this podcast. Um, but before we start with where you're going and all the excitement associated with that. Um, I'd love to hear the backstory of Infinity because it doesn't – it predates even yourself, doesn't it? It do- uh, No, I was one. Oh, when, one years old. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So uh, your father started um, 34 years ago now and in life insurance, obviously the tight agent. Um, so I always grew up around financial services, always wanted to be in the business and then – I mean, 24, 25, and I was going to start with dad and he said, look, you're not ready, you're old enough yet, not enough. Life. Sorry, when you were four or five? 24. Okay, 25. just checking. Okay. Yeah, okay. Right, right. <laughs> Do I say four? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so then he said, you're not, you're not quite old enough yet. So I came back to the business um, when I was 27 and I just had to cut my teeth. He said, once you can do every job once um, – correctly well then you can move on to the next one so forth and so forth so it started out with um paper applications and hand filling them out sending them off to products and making mistakes and having to fix it so i've definitely learned um some good lessons through that and then obviously progressed into being an advisor and and pre that what was your what were were your jobs before you you came back into the fold Uh, i like sport at school a lot so i didn't really study too much and uh, ended up doing a school-based apprenticeship and then started my own maintenance business off the back of that and had three or four carpenters um, running around and doing some labouring work. So, you know, it was, it was good. Okay. Okay. So, quite entrepreneurial from an early, uh, early sort of start. Yeah. Oh, very good. And um, so, you've joined up at 27. Now, yes. you look a little bit older than 27, not that much no, older, no, but a little yeah. bit older. So And, and so, after those paper-based applications, sort of, how, what was your journey from employee to, to to boss effectively? How did that go? Yeah, so that's if you if you can't put bums on seats and talk to people, you can have all the amazing strategies in the world, but you've got to play them out in real life. So go find some clients. And and how and what what sort of clients did you find at the tender age of twenty seven? Yeah, not great clients, but back then, obviously, uh, giving advice is a lot less. Um, expensive so i was able to, to help out with some mates um really pushed hard with referrals and then my wife fell pregnant um so i thought well yeah it's really important to have life insurance and my sister who does the marketing for our company always talks about hanging out where your clients are and you'll find more so i ended up doing a baby show uh, and stood there father thought i was a madman um for doing it he turned up and laughed but i think i booked 68 appointments that day. 
So was that the toddler and baby show? Correct. I remember it vividly. There you go. I reckon yeah. some of my businesses went there as well. Great yeah. time. People have it got was. people have got big decisions they've got to make, and yeah. they've, they've come on in the yeah. twinkling of an eye, so to speak. Yeah, my wife wasn't. She would have been thirty weeks pregnant, standing there. But um, if she backed me in, so it ended up working out well, and it was a good organic um, way to build a client base. I quite often ask, you know, what were the events that shaped shaped you? But uh, that that sounds like one. So that was in the uh, what the Brisbane Exhibition Centre or something. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very good. And um, and and many of those clients um, back then, I think they would have been what two thousand and thirteen or fourteen. Correct. That's about it. Yep. And um, how many of them are still in the Infinity Stable? We've got a pretty good retention rate, around about 97%. So I was only speaking to Will, who's looking after those clients today, and he said, yeah, actually one of them it was a nurse, and she applied for a job with us yesterday, and she's a client. Because she's over being a nurse, she wants to get into financial services. So. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. uh, uh, people coming out of nursing um, actually make really good financial planners. They're, they've so got the great. empathy. Yeah. They've got the human side, and, and, and the skills can be taught. This is a whole other podcast <laughs> subject. And um, But what I might do is, is get back to the actual yep. engine room yep. um, and w- – your business now is is has grown. It's multidisciplined. Yeah. But what I'd like to do is just ask you a bit about the type of clients that you currently love taking care of and the, the range of services mm. um, that you have. Just paint the picture for me, please. Yeah, we've got a, a wide variety of clients. I wouldn't say that we try and niche into an area exactly. Um, you know, we've got clients that Dad took on some of them nurse me at appointments um, and they're still there today and they've got small pension accounts but obviously we do the right thing and look after them. We've got some larger business clients um, that have kind of grown with us over time. So if I was to say what we'd ideally, what we're really good at looking after is that um, 45-year-old professional, time poor, got a house, got young kids, um, you know, and they, and they really want to spend some good time with an advisor, an accountant, and a broker in the one spot and not waste too much time. So I might just labour that point. So an advisor, an accountant, and a broker in the one spot. Yeah. There's no one more time poor than someone who's, uh, who, who's, who's full-time employed, raising children and probably looking after their elderly parents. That's the sandwich generation. Yeah. Yep. So as far as an organisational structure, if I'm a client of yours, do I – see all of those people at once or is there a process maybe get a give me a feel for how you how you roll out those services please yeah that that's the holy grail but i suppose we went to go back to how we got to that part um we surveyed our clients in 2017 and said we always ask our clients what can we do what can we do for you guys and they said oh if you could have all this in one spot it'd be really good so then we went on a process of acquiring accounting firms um some it's more so that a client He's got, you know, uh, what am I putting into superannuation this year? We can quickly turn out to the back and get the information off the accountant and, and give the advice there. Occasionally, we will have all people in the room um, when the advisor is giving advice. But, yeah, it's not – doesn't happen all the time. And um, maybe give me a feel for your organisational structure. Um, how many ARs do you have in advice? Seven. Seven ARs. And, ha- and how are they supported? So we've kind of gone with a um, – corporatized back office so we did split them across the three sites we had but now we've kind of pushed them all back into into the brisbane office more so to give some staff redundancy so if someone we've got two people just in implementation three or four power plans just doing power planning work uh, and it's all got to come through one process gets vetted and that, that team sits together and then goes back out to the, to the office or to the advisor and um, with your multi-locations, you're based in Brisbane City and also yes. the Gold Coast, is that right? Gold Coast and Cleveland. Cleveland, okay. So north north and east Brisbane, is that yep, right? Yeah, correct. Okay. And where does the um, engine room sit? The engine room sits in uh, Brisbane, in Bowen Hills. We right. just moved offices 12 months ago, so. And so you've moved, you, you moved office just at the end of COVID. You made a call. Correct. Well, we were growing and the, the office were in, you know, got a bit small for numbers, so we need someone that c- could accommodate the growth, you know, over the next five, six years. And what's the head count? Good question. I interviewed, did four interviews yesterday, so one of them will get a job. I think it'll take us to 40. Um, Shout out to those uh, three who aren't getting a yeah, job in case, you, in case you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're just finalising another acquisition, which would be another head count of five. So 
45 mark, yeah. Okay, and that, is that – um, so you mentioned, you know, yourself and your father have come through the financial planning um, uh, sort of background. Yes. Um, so have you acquired accounting businesses or more Correct. financial planning businesses? We were acquiring small accounting, you know, risk books. Uh, then the Royal Commission hit and we didn't know where valuations would, would land. Yep. Um, so we pivoted and went into acquiring accounting firms very hard to get the first one away, but yeah, we've we've done two, and this will be our third one coming up shortly. So, are you uh, are you acquiring the people as well? So, is correct. It, okay. So, and how how we're going to talk about people and culture later on. I'd be very interested in how not only have you integrated accountants into your business, but also how you continue to bring them in and how they fit into your culture, um, because that's. That'd Tough. be one, yeah. It's one of the more difficult <laughs> things, you know, and also to stay true to yourselves, yeah, and not be um sort of pulled off 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 course. Um, now, give me a bit of a feel for you know the delivery of advice. So you've got your you've got your ARs. Um, the types of clients that you have would have quite dynamic statements of advice requirements. Um, being being wealth accumulators, yeah. Um, how, how do you deliver advice? Is it does, is it a lot of people have their hands on it, or does one person take it all the way through? So we we're big believers in advisors talk, should be talking to clients and giving advice. Um, filling out paperwork is not really what they're good at. Um, they're good at simplifying um, complex and delivering it to a client. So they've got a lot of support. They generally run two people in a meeting. Um, we've got two PY, yeah, two PYs at the moment, and they support the advisors. Um, and then we've got some associates and other support people that kind of do all the file noting. But the advisors, ideally, two meetings a day, um, five days a week, and that keeps them pretty busy in front of clients. And we were talking off air that you've you've made some mistakes yes. um, uh, in relation to putting your engine room, so to speak, together. Maybe if you could share the learnings from those mistakes. We, the, now that you've stopped crying yeah, intently, yeah, yeah. Um, just so give me a feel for the learnings. The mis- first of all, the mistakes that yep. you felt that you made, and and what you've learned, and how you've changed the structure of the business. Yeah. So if you're sitting across, yeah, you know, it's sporting advisor from start to finish. You're doing a little bit of implementation. You're doing a little bit of um, yeah, uh, applications, fact-finding, file notes, opposed to sitting down uh, and concentrating on one task and owning that one task. So originally, our associates and support people were just floating across roles and mistakes were happening. So I've now brought that back and corporatized it back into the office and we've got redundancy in the role. So if someone's sick or someone leaves the business, there's always a second person that kind of can pick up where that person's left off. And the concept of owning the task, is, it just plays into yep. that accountability piece. 100%. And when everyone's accountable, no one's yep. accountable. And I think <laughs> that, you know, if we had a dollar for, for that. And um, what other tools um, uh, have you been using? So maybe get us a feel for maybe your tech stack, whether you use um, any kind of uh, uh, sort of contractors. Yeah. Get us a feel for, you know, how you've you've managed to bring that corporatization in, please. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm one for giving everything a go. I don't really mull on decisions. Uh, we decided to work with IntelliFlow in 2019. I saw them present in London. They said they're going to Australia. A little so, birdie tells me you're their first Australian client. We were. We've been working for a very long time now. Um and it's been good. It, it's, it's had its bumpy roads, but in all, it's a good CRM. We're very happy with it. Um, and it's got a long runway um, of development to go. And they're a really good team to work with. So that's our tech stack. Um, we use CDM, which is another tech that's come out for insurance. It's pretty popular in the market now. So what, what makes it good? It just pulls all your data and puts it into one CRM dashboard um, where you can see what policies are lapsing, uh, what's up for renewal, and then you can quickly get a, a get a price um, if you need to reprice a product. So we've only just started using it in March. Um, insurance is hard to write, so any any kind of leg up you can get to streamline the process um, is a win. So we've been happy with that one. And look, that's a bit of a, a common theme um, with with practices. So you definitely still. Um, uh, our life insurance focused business? No, not now. We were. We would be 70 wealth, more wealth now. We brought out uh, SMAs um, with our license. Um, so we've definitely gone pivoted down the wealth part. Okay. And um, any other pieces of technology outside of those? Just all your like your typo forms, your things that sit around the edge, pipe drive to manage the advisor's pipeline. 
Um, RevX is a new revenue processing that we've just brought in uh, probably two months ago. And so, I suppose that leads me to the question, if, you, if you're doing revenue processing, you're obviously now moving down the self-license route. Yes. So is that something that uh, maybe give us an idea of what drove you to do that and, and where you see the benefits for your own practice of being self-licensed? Yeah, uh, it was a big decision. It was probably one of those in 2017, 2019, the business transformed a lot. And in that period, we went self-licensed. So I was over in London on the NetWealth tour and I was the only one in a license there. And Matt Hine said, look, you know, if you want to scale the business and get to the right size, you need to have accounting, you need to have self-light, you need to have an SMA. Um, so we came back from that and pulled the trigger in 2020 um, and haven't looked back, been really happy with that. And what's the, what's the main sort of uh, benefit? Has it been the ability to be the master of your own destiny with, with investments or what do you see as the main benefit? Yeah, well, we, we again outsource the the compliance um, framework to to smart compliance. Brett Walker, a lot of people use him. He's, he does a great job. But yeah, it gives you that uh, bit of flexibility, I suppose. Um, and obviously, able to run your own SMAs and, and create your own you know, investment menu, also with your insurance process. So yeah, it's. And with the SMA, um, what, what, how, how did you put it together? It's, so you've only been going since 2020. Um, who, who do you use for investment? What's the platform? Yeah. Again, I, we, we're good at outsourcing, I think. We're, financial planners, I don't think, should be building investment portfolios. You don't have time to sit there and do the research um, on a fund or an equity and put together a portfolio. So we interviewed three um, external asset consultants and landed with Evidentia, one of the best decisions we've made. Um, again, because of their size, we were able to drive down the, the total portfolio cost to our clients and pass that back to them, which has been really good. But advisors, it's hard enough to keep up legislation and make sure your SOA is structured correctly, let alone sitting there and trying to build and throw darts at a wall on a, on a portfolio. So, And what was the platform you chose? NetWealth. NetWealth, okay. So Hub and NetWealth are up there. But well, sh- shout out to Matt. Might, yeah, have, taken, might have taken yeah, four yeah. or five years now. <laughs> and, but, but he got there in the end. He did, yeah. <laughs> and it was more of a thank you to the NetWealth tour. He kind of really gave me the right ideas to, to pivot the business. So Yeah, right. Um, and with your operational hat on, because you do some advising as well as operations, or you're no, now don't fully see, no clients. Okay, so you've transitioned to to running the business of the yes. business. Okay, great. And we we might talk about what your view of um, sort of financial services businesses are mm. towards the end of this podcast. How do you measure your operations? How do you know it's a good day? How do I know it's a good day? I have lots of little sheets I call hot sheets. On like for hot sheets for financial planning, which I get at Monday at twelve o'clock. Uh, productivity sheets for counting and lending, I get hot sheets as well. So um, it's one page and it's got um, reviews, meetings, fee renewals, uh, lost clients, one clients, and new business written. Would you call them your critical numbers? Oh yeah, and we have a fifteen minute by eight long meeting. So. Um, zoom in, call in, or be in the fifteen minute meeting at eleven o'clock for advisors. I think eleven fifteen for lending and accounting. After that, it does smell suspiciously like daily huddles. So I've, uh, I think we did speak off air. We do share the same <laughs> cult like uh, at um, sort of uh, adhesion to the Rockefeller habits. Is that is that uh, something that you've you've been involved in? And if so, um, how has that taken you through the journey? Yeah, so uh, one of your businesses and business partners, Dave Carney, uh, I was, we were using some outsourcing um, in another location, which ended up jumping to plane. It wasn't really working out. And so I said, I'll give this one go, one more go, and ended up going to, uh, to VBP and met Dave Carney and, he said, you can, do the, you, know, you can do outsourcing, but you can do it successfully. This is the way I would run it. And then he ended up, him and I got on quite well and so did my father and he ended up giving us a lot of advice quarterly around the, the Vern Harnish, you know, scaling up process. So we've adopted that, infinitized it a little bit um, and run off the back of that for structure. Did everyone just get that infinitize? <laughs> yeah, okay, that, that's a takeout. And look, um, I, I think it's well known that that, that um, Dave Carney was also my business coach, yeah, as as well. And um, and uh, it's it's getting those critical numbers, making people accountable, um, and empowering people, but yeah. making them accountable. And 
with an expansive mind like you, you, yourself, sometimes it's also just getting those 100 things to do and getting those rocks or those priorities. Yeah, correct. Would you agree? Yeah. And um, uh, so I don't know if you're listening, Dave, but um, you've, you've got another successful one here. We, 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 we might need to touch base from time to time, <laughs> but, um, but we'll, we'll do our best. Now, um, I've noticed that you've got an investment board yes. um, and that's come, uh, I imagine, as part of the journey being self-licensed yep. and a bit more there. Do you have a, an overall board for running your, your, your business? Yeah, yep. So dad's still in the business. Obviously, he's a major shareholder. Um, we've got an external accountant advisor yep. that sits on that. Um, Dave Carney gives a bit of commentary to that board as well. Um, uh, James Mead's helped in the past, another XMLC corporate Um Pretty much to make sure I stay on the straight and narrow. So, you know, I can, I'm good at chasing projects. And so it gets put up there, the financials and, and the projects. You know, we always say one thing a month, 12 things a year. Um, and that's enough to change. So, and with, with that in mind, um, when did you start down the path of becoming multidisciplined? It was a long journey because if you're not an accountant, and you try and buy an accounting firm without an accountant to run it, no broker will talk to you. Uh, I was very lucky. I was a firm that was looking to, to acquire some of our, our, our business and merge it into an accounting firm. It just didn't make sense at the time, and I was negotiating on acquiring this other accounting firm down the road at the same time, and he kept asking me, who's going to run the firm? I said, that's, that's my problem, not yours. Oh, I've well, got it all sorted and had no idea. Anyway, when I did the tour of the, the business trying to acquire us, I saw a guy I went to school with, which happened to be the son of the other firm that I was trying to acquire. For me, it's path, this one. Yeah, it was a Hail Mary. And I just I said to him, I said, are you happy? He said, no, I want to you know, be a partner somewhere. I said, well, you can tell me to piss off if you like, but we're actually in the process of acquiring your, your father's firm. Very lucky. And what, what's this gentleman's name? Uh, Will Clark. Will Clark, and he's now your accounting partner. Yes, correct. Yes, he heads up the accounting division and runs a tax license. And and how many years ago was that? That was in right at COVID. Right, okay, okay. 2020. And so we're three years in. How's the integration of clients been? And so it's always a... Next question. <laughs> it's it's always the, the hard thing is integrating yeah. the clients. And have you built up sort of a, a rhythm of, of how yep. you do that? Yep. So Matt, who, who heads up our lending, uh, Will heads up the accounting, and myself, we, we take half an afternoon off every quarter and just to redefine our strategy. And we've decided um, last year that we'd run a we've one team, one dream. And we're getting really intentional about that. Um, the one team, it, I don't, if you're an advisor, you're an accountant, you're a broker, you're, you're, you're one team uh, with the client's end dream. You know, build more wealth, pay less tax uh, and buy a house. It's not complex, that isn't. Um, so we... That's I picked it up off Dave. We we run that theme through the office, front to back. Tomorrow afternoon we've got a end of month um, one team one dream meeting, and we we're theming. I think they're theming it Mexican style or something tomorrow. So they'll cook nachos and wear crazy hats. Um, breakfast tequila. Yeah, breakfast tequila. Hopefully not at that end. <laughs> um, yes, that starts at four o'clock last Friday of every month, or if, like this time it'll roll over, and all the teams zoom in and we talk about our referral rate. And so when you say all the teams zoom in, you're in four physical locations yep. plus you've got a global team. Yep. Um, how do you maintain um, sort of the, the culture or, or do, you, do you do get-togethers or how, what, what's one of the things that you do to, to bring post-COVID to yeah. bring people along yep, on that yep. journey, that one team, one dream? Well, we nearly because it, it's quite a you know, sizable office now. Um, you know, I've got four reports and underneath that, there's teams underneath there. We, we were contemplating going down the corporate path. Yes, if you're not at work, you're not here. Um, no work from home. Struck really structured and a bit like a bank. And then we kind of stopped for a minute. So that's just it's not my father and I. We just easy going, cruise around. Well, let's just let that run through the office. So engage a consultant. Where we're looking at uh, maybe one day off a month for staff. You can work from home, dress for your appointments, dress or dress for your day, they call it, um, and introducing that. So we've got our annual half day or half year strategy at Stradbroke Island in July and we'll nice. roll that out to the team. But again, we'll consult with them saying, this is what we're thinking. Do you like it? Do you not? 
um, and and then we'll implement off the back of that. So a more relaxed theme. So moving on to the people side of it, mm. and you know you're a bundle of energy, and I, I do I do think the self awareness that you've got to put people and processes in place mainly to to slow down your expansive thinking is <laughs> is is genius. Um, but what why do people why do people join you? Why do they stay and why do they grow? Yeah, um, like I was saying yesterday, uh, if, if you're coming here to be managed, is not the place for you. Um, we run off uh, TPR, Tolerance, Patience, Respect. So could you say that again? T, tolerance, Patience, Respect is our three core values that my Thank father you. I grew up with. Um, and so if you've got that for your, for your staff and for your clients or your teammates and your clients, and then just or, you, you've got to be autonomous. We're not going to sit there and ask why are you 15 minutes late? Or don't ask me, you need to go to the doctors or you don't you need to pick your kids up from school. Just do it. Just do your job. Like if it takes you five hours or 50 hours, that's up to you. And does that reflect if in the way in which you've structured up people's job descriptions? Yeah, Is it yeah. outcome-based or, or outcome-based? Based? Yep, because I don't want to sit there and, and I'm not in the office all the time. I'm on the phone. I can work remotely. Yep. So why not staff can have that too? And just on the communications between all the staff, um, what's the platform do you use? Teams, I'm not great. I just Microsoft Teams. Yeah, yep. I just pick up the phone and ring. Yep. But I know that they, they use Teams in the office. Yep. Uh, another tech stack, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned Zeppo. Uh, I've been speaking to some of your team over in the Philippines um, and we're looking at integrating Zeppo as their master spreadsheet. Matthew Heiner again gave me that tip um, to look at how we can, where our clients sit and how we can integrate them better and know where we are on a daily basis. Okay, so yeah, and, and just knowing what you've got to do for a living and knowing where you are and having that full information, you kind of people don't have an excuse but to do their job, do they? Yeah, correct. And the hot sheets don't lie. That's right. That the hot sheets. You've got you've got to enunciate that correctly. You say it too fast. <laughs> it's, it's definitely not not a phrase for podcasts. Um, now, tell me about your recruitment process. It's hard. That's what it is. Uh, Yesterday I had I had four interviews. Um, we, we, we've been told three of them are going to fail. You just told yeah, that. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> um, no, no, shout out. This, this is, <laughs> these ones are different. Yeah, so we've got Seek. We've just paid a very large recruitment fee that unfortunately didn't work out after four days. Um, our best has come from the university. So we've got a little scholarship with Griffith University. Um, so we've actually got a candidate starting in the accounting side of the business. It came from from that um, process last week. Uh, word of mouth. Uh, I, I say to people, put it out in your little Facebook groups, whatever that we're looking for people. And we well, have forty people in yeah. plus people in your business. Yeah, correct. Tell me about the the Griffith University. Um, is it like an internship or is it what what, what intern did- into full time? Okay, okay. Yeah. That's been our best. We all look at our best staff. Um, that have done really well with our business, Will, Bray. That's where they've all come from, so I thought I'd just go back to the source. No worries. And um, I, I know um, from, from anecdotal history um, you manage a global team. Mm. What, what tips do you have for other people who are looking to, to manage uh, teams in, in different countries? The daily huddle. Um, if someone can work out of Cleveland, why can't they work out of Philippines? If someone can work in Sydney for a Brisbane office, why can't they work out of the Philippines? <laughs> Um, they're very efficient. They've got a lot of support around them uh, if they can't get something right. And they're lovely people. They're very honest, truthful people. But getting back to it, it's, it's that having that daily huddle. You're only 24 hours away um, yeah. from, from a, a solution or sorting yeah. out a problem. And, yeah. and having that cadence, hmm. that regular cadence, um, creates uh, comfort. Yeah, I've got, being- and having managers that manage them. So Aaron... Uh, he's an integral part of the advice team. He manages the the power plan and the compliance. Uh, Aronson manages the support and implementation team. So, and he's regularly communicating with them all day. So, um, your your stereotypical back office effectively are uh, logistics. They're managing flow of information, yep. workflows as well. Okay, well that sounds pretty good. Now, how do you reward your people? What, do, what does what does uh, what does success look like for uh, um, your firm? And if you are successful, what do you do for fun? Um, yeah, we do like to keep a bit of fun in the office. We're going to, like I said, there our half. We got this strategy trip came about when we opened the Cleveland office, and every time we do an end of year video, uh, everyone just talks about the funny stuff that happens on that trip. 
so they enjoy that. We do a, we we try to do a, a nice Christmas party, uh, and then we've got a beer tap in the beer in the in the lunchroom. Okay, even my sound guy is nodding. He's yeah. he's he's absolutely had no passion <laughs> at all for the last thirty minutes, and now he's nodding and smirking. Well, it's good. So, it brings people together, really. On a Friday or Thursday afternoon, they sit around there, pour a couple of beers, and it might be an accountant talking to an advisor or a broker, and yeah. Yeah, look, I think um, uh, the, it's still a relationship business. Yeah. And relationships can be with you and your client, but it can also be with you and the team that services that family group. And I think that um, if I was a client, I would like to know that the team that I've got get on well with each other yeah. and there's trust and, 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 and a real common desire to, to achieve for me. That would be my, my, my yeah. thoughts. And then we also like sending you know our team that have worked really hard to the VBP conference. Um, I think Han's going over there. He's in the power planning team. Uh, we, our number one IntelliFlow user, because IntelliFlow has that data to see who's using what, when, and how. They, uh, Brie is off to the IntelliFlow conference in London uh, next week, I think. She jumps on a plane. and Does, does she know it or is this, yeah, is this hot she off does, the press? Yeah, yeah, I hope so because the flights are booked. Yeah, she's <laughs> tying on a, a bit of time, I think, in Paris. So good on her. Well, that sounds. I mean, that sounds awesome. And um, in relation to uh, your your business, you, you say you do the daily huddles. You've got quarterly uh, meetings. Um, the types of clients that you have, mm. um, how often do they require uh, their meetings? What's the service sort of um, uh, rollout for you guys? Yeah, I I'm not a big believer in annual reviews. Like, if something happens to me now and I've got to wait nine months to see my advisor, it's just not. You know, doesn't make sense. Um, the annual reviews are booked in because that's just the way the industry's set up. But we're very active. Um, your, your lowest service agreement would be a phone call every six months. But most of our clients have got stuff going on. They're buying houses, so they're coming to us anyway. So we find out um, every three years. Yeah, every three years. Yep. If yep. something happens, they're they're having kids. They're Correct. moving house. They're changing career. And they're doing their tax. A lot of them do their tax with us. So they're coming in for that as well. So they'll pop in, and I'll, I'll talk to the advisor for five minutes. Um, so they're really cli- close, tight relationships with their clients. Um, and with the the business that you've got with the forty odd people, um, you know, going to work uh, in, in a business uh, is 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 wonderful. And uh, in this country at the moment, almost everyone has a yeah. job. So these days, people want to work for a business that has a bit of purpose, a bit of heart. Um, do you run a, a charitable program at all? Yeah, my wife and I are heavily involved in the children's hospital. Um, she meets, she donates uh, every Thursday. She's part of the, the committee there. I think our last fundraiser, one hundred eighty thousand. Oh wow! Um, yeah, so if we and so we're part of a committee. So I think there's seven of us on that. Uh, Ian Fraser, Doctor Ian Fraser, who came up with the cervical cancer vaccine. If we raise five million dollars, he's going to donate his time because he said that's the funding I need. I think he won. The Australian of the Year for yeah, that. He did. He yeah. did, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's wow. Him. So he's committed. So if we can get $5 million together, he's going to work on children's brain cancer. Magnificent. So, But we started that in 2019. Uh, we were at hospital with my youngest and he had, a, had to have a simple operation at four weeks and the child next door um, got brain cancer. Wow. That's so terrible. I just got curious and then asked, you know, basically we just need money. So we ended up. I did a lunch. I think we raised thirty or forty grand, and we bought a fridge that stores the the cancer cells. Um, and I, my wife was up there the other week, and she had a look at the fridge. It's still there. It's nearly filled with brain uh, brain cancer samples. And do you, did you bring your clients on this this journey with you? Is that part of it? We are. So, in 2019, we there was a client um, event. The we had our launch event the other night. That wasn't a climb one, but we got a big three hundred people gala, three hundred fifty people gala at uh, Howard Street Wharf later on the year. So they'll be involved in that. Well, that's magnificent. Um, you know, I, I often ask these questions, and and you get a real range of answers. But yeah. the one commonality is uh, is something I always bring up is that. The DNA of a financial planner is someone who cares about people. Mm. Um, you know, we're much maligned, but but ultimately, um, uh, there's that, that deep care. And look, congratulations to you and, and your wife um, yeah. for for, for uh, putting that in. And you know, every Thursday yeah, is, is is not a token gesture. No, it's yeah. not throwing you know two dollars tax yeah. deductible at something. So um, <laughs> you know, a big 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 shout out there. And how have you have you had thoughts about how you could bring that into something that your your team members can get involved in? Yeah, we've been 
toying around with the idea, um, it is because my sister, she runs their marketing and I've kind of handballed that one off, which I do very well to her. Um, so she's looking at different ways other businesses have integrated that in um, and obviously doing a big website rejuvenation at the moment. So we'll push that message out there. Um, but yeah. And the business um, that you're, yourself and your father are founded, mm. it's owned along the traditional kind of format. Um, what, what's your vision for the future with, with the business as it gets bigger and bigger? Yeah, as it gets bigger and bigger. Um, Dad is, you know, I think he worked to 75. He can't sit still. He's not in there every day, but he's always about. He's the nice guy. Um, we, we want to bring up our younger advisors and staff members. We, we've been talking to um, some private equity firms about, you know, producing some capital um, and, and maybe myself and my father selling down some equity. Okay. So, so, okay, so it's not just a, a thought bubble. You've, you've, no. And lo- as you, you've bought and sold businesses, it's, it's, a, it's a long process and lots of uh, tax issues, compliance and things that you've got to get through. So, yeah, we're working away working at that at the moment. Well, I hope you've informed your team that this is on the horizon because yes. they're probably going to listen to this. <laughs> so, um, no, no, well done. Well, that's, you know, a big part of my question, um, is, is all about, uh, the people and culture. You know, you might have built this, this, this best practice, um, operations, but unless you've got people willing to put discretionary effort yeah. and ideas in future, um, you don't have that one, yeah. one, one team, one dream. So, yeah. so well done on that yeah, front. Thank you. Um, and, um, what I was also going to ask, uh, the, What's an error that you've made in, in relation to people and culture? You know, have you had any kind of learnings um, that you've done? Yes. Yeah, I made a lot of errors. I don't know where to start. Um, we, which, it, this podcast doesn't go forever, so I'm just going to pick the top <laughs> 30 hours. No, yeah. no, just, just throw, throw me one that, that, that you've got a learning No, from. I wasn't part. I removed myself from the recruitment process there for a bit. Yep. Um, and some of those staff mightn't have been great for the business uh, and then – Obviously, it didn't didn't last too long. But why? Um, what do you think you bring well, to the recruitment process? Our DNA. Yep. You, you can teach anything, but if they don't have the right culture and, and the right purpose. Um, and is this, this pur- hark back to that tolerance, patience and, yeah, and respect? Yeah, 100%. Yep. yep. And, and do, do you ask people, you know, how, how examples of when they've had those things in their life? Yeah, you do. Um, pretty much that's most of the interview. You know, if, and you can tell, you know, you can, you got to have respect for the, the Woolies checkout lady when you get your groceries. So that thank you, you have a smile. You just don't know what day they're having. So you can tell when someone walks into the, to the room and they speak to the receptionist, the way they ask for a coffee or a water, you can tell if they have that. Yeah. And I think that, um, if you can tell from first impressions, then your clients aren't dummies. They can tell as well. Agreed. Yeah. And, um, uh, coming from, from, from Brisbane, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a big country town. A lot of people exactly. say that. So um, I, I think that, that they are very uh, down to earth um, in the way in which they conduct yep. themselves. Yep. So uh, no, that's fine. And um, the industry. Okay. So uh, if you don't mind me asking, um, uh, how old are you now? Nearly 36. Okay. So you've been in this game for, for 10 years, plus, or actually yeah. th- 35 years because you Correct. started when you were one. Yeah. <laughs> um, you had that rough patch you know, between, you know, uh, yeah, between nine and 11 yeah. where you drifted off to probably play some sport uh, for a while. But so you've got a good business, you've got a good platform, and you've, you've, you, you are at least, you know, 15 to 20 years in this industry. Um, what do you see as the vision for, Financial advice practices. Yep. Um, maybe start with with what you think would be the ideal, and then also where you think the spin-offs will be in building a practice. Yeah. Um, Paul Barrett, one of, I think your last guest on this show, uh, releases some good content just around these super firms, which we kind of read religiously when he releases the information. It's really hard to to run a practice as a single man band and keep up with compliance and keep the lights on. Um, so you've got to have some scalability and you've got to be able to pay people the right money for the expertise to work in the business. Um, the margins of what they were running 20, 30 years ago is way gone. So expect good return on investment, but you've got to have the right scale to get that. And I think you just said something very profound. You've got to pay people the right amount of money to do the, the job. Yeah. And I think, um, uh, well, you know, a while ago in this um, interview, you um, – said that you had people doing bits and pieces of jobs. 
Yep. You're probably paying them bits and pieces of wages. Correct. And now, now you, now you, you're getting hyper, hyper, yep. hyper specialized people who you then are also, I imagine, scaffolding with dish ongoing training and development. Yeah, correct. And get out of the way. And just, uh, yeah, and you, and, and, and just have yep. that, that sort of objective. Um, so you're, you're a big fan of, of the super firm. And super firms are the, the ones where, where you are building that engine. Yeah. Um, but the counterpoint to that is that you're a you're one one business where people come in. Yep. Do you ever refer out for any speciality? Is there any um any need to? I, might, I imagine maybe state planning state, or whatnot. state planning. Yeah, legal clients come to us for a lot of things. Real estate agents, but I've got a Cohen handler. I've got a good relationship with them for as a buyer's agent. Yep. Lawyers. Yeah. Yep. So so they're going out and they're sort of a specialist for a particular transaction, and they yeah, come correct. back into the fold. Yep. Um. And since you've had the accounting firm where people, you know, are compelled to have to use you every year, mm. have you found that that's in, improved or, or picked up on, on client developments faster or, or is it just still down to that ongoing financial planning relationship? Yeah, the financial planning relationship is the sticky one. Um, they'll generally come in to see their financial planner and go through everything. A lot of the times people just email their accountant. It's, I'll send that back, sign that, and get it done. It's a transaction. Um, but because they're coming in, we always uncover more things for an accounting-wise. Um, so it's helped with that by just running those joint meetings or being out of the accountants don't like it too much. But come out, come out the front in, meet with John, and, oh, yeah, righto. Um, and the, the, account, the clients really appreciate that. Yeah, and I think so. Putting a, a face to the name yeah. is correct. Um, now – with your growth plans, I know that you um uh, you flew all the way down to Sydney today just to talk to me. I wish that was the case, but you're actually in Sydney because you've got some other plans afoot. Um, yeah. Maybe may give us a bit of an idea of what uh, what's the next steps in your your business growth. Yeah. I suppose back to to square one um, for Sydney. We've we've got a, a substantial amount of clients, not enough to have a, a standalone office and support team down here. Um, Will. Um, in our office and advisor, we've been with five or six years now. He's actually at the baby show, setting up right now. Is that so, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll give it a test down here and when the right acquisition comes up. Um, so we were intentionally here. Um, we don't have a footprint as such, but we're definitely making a way to be down here permanently. <laughs> what would be the type of practice that you'd love to um, get involved with? Would they be similar to you or would they be – um, you know, pure play financial planning or accounting that you'd like to bring into your business? Yeah, it would be a, a financial planning firm. We do like um, the insurance books, um, the advisors that are getting too stressed and too overwhelmed with no back office or no scalability that want to, would want to join and slowly exit um, for retirement. So nothing huge, I would say, but just the right firm. And again, same, with, same way we interview staff, we interview our, our buyers, so... And um, as far as organic growth uh, in in uh, Brisbane in head office, we've now come out of a COVID. We're now getting that there. Are you seeing an uptick in the organic growth as far as client numbers with your advisors? Definitely. Um, client referrals from other clients has been significant. Uh, the accountants do refer quite a lot, so a lot does come from there. But I've never seen – as many new faces walk through the door on my hot sheets, um, come through our office. So you can't go – we've got an office out at Cleveland. Suncorp Bank branch was there. So now they seem to be finding their way into our office. So it's worked well. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and in relation to the, um, the vision for the industry, you've mentioned what you would say would be a super firm. Um, but where do you see the industry going, given that you've got a lot of runway in front of you? Um, I, you hope for all these things, but all you can do is just play what's in front of you. So I, I, being self-licensed, you stay away from a lot of the noise. Um, the rules are the rules. I don't think they're going to pull them back like they say. I don't think they're going to make it cheaper to deliver, to deliver advice. Um, just get on with it. It's, you can still run a profitable practice the way it is. Um, you can't change it. So I don't want to make a prediction in the next 12 months, let alone three or four years. So I'll just play out the rules that are in front of me. Well, it's fair to say, I mean, you've been um, in practice in proper since 2013. I yeah. think the future of financial advice 
started rolling out in 2012. So change right. has been your your only constant yeah. Yeah. Um, in your career. And um, look, I've known you for a couple of years and I've seen the the growth uh, both uh, vertically and horizontally in, in, in the business and the offerings um, that you have. Um, I'm also seeing how you care for your team and then how that responds as well. Um, and so if anyone would like to uh, reach out to these guys there's plenty of links there if you're in sydney yes. and you, and and what the uh, it's called infinitize infinitize and and you want to be part of the infinitize <laughs> sounds like a a, 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 a a sort of a um a, like something you can dance to yeah. um if you want to be part of that infinitization i just made that up Definitely um that. then 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 reach out as well and tim on on behalf of uh the engine room podcast um thank you for coming in we're trying to promote um the people behind the advisors, the people that that uh, sort problems out, create problems, then sort them out again. And, and thank you very much for your time. Yeah, no problem, Andrew. Thanks for having me along. Cheers, mate.